Rainier Valley Historical Society's mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and interpret the history and heritage of Rainier Valley and its people, and to promote public involvement in and appreciation of its history and culture. Our geographic boundaries are from Dearborn Street to the city limits and from I-5 to Lake Washington. Our office is located at 3710 South Ferdinand Street in the Columbia City neighborhood of Seattle. Years uh, that we did together, uh, uh, both as community activists. Uh, let me talk about my book. Uh, it's titled, and you see there on the screen, My Unforgotten Seattle. Um, for those who like to read, um, it's, it's a bit of a long read. It's uh, 600 pages. So you get your money's worth. But for those who get scared off by that uh, number of pages, uh, be aware that someone I'm someone who has poor vision. So I decided the print's going to be big. And the chapters are going to be short. So there are 72 chapters. So um, treat them kind of like um, little tidbits that you can bite into. They're self-contained stories that are part of a larger story. So people um, are surprised by how easy it is to consume. Um, so don't be put off. Also, if you're the type of person who likes pictures, there are a lot of them. And they, there actually is a mid -sec, middle section of the book that has all the pictures um, sort of in sequence with captions, almost like its own little mini book. So for those who just wanted to have the benefit of a big thick book to impress your friends and relatives, you can buy a book and just look at the middle section and be able to almost read and go through time uh, that way. There's a fairly um, extensive index as well. So another is my point being that um, don't be scared off. And uh, I think there will be something here uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, Seattle history, which I'm sure um, most, if not all of you are. Um, let me tell you what's in the book and how it came about. Um, and I see on the screen it says, proceeds go to the Donnie Chin Memorial Fund. Um, actually the proceeds from the sale of the book go to the International Examiner, which is the publisher of the book. Um, but Donnie Chin was the person who inspired the book. Um, you, some of you may recall back in 2015, a big story in the news about a medic in Chinatown who was uh, gunned down in the crossfire between uh, some rival gangs. So that was Donnie Chen. He worked in the community since uh, he was in junior high school as a medic, uh, helping um, ensure that people in the community got the service that they needed. Um, he had passed away. Uh, it, it had been about a year. Uh, in the interim period, uh, Bob Santos, a community activist in the Chinatown area, International District area, had also passed away. Charles E. Smith had passed away. Rachel Hadaka, um, Ruth Wu, Frank Fuji. I'm just rattling off some names because I suspect you may have heard of some of these folks. Um, I was on a run um, over by um, the Jefferson Golf Course, and I was thinking about how fragile our history is. And I'm sure it's something you all think about as well. And I said to myself, well, I've been a journalist. Um, I, I think I should write something. I think it, I, I want to take my hand at doing a memoir. So the book um, followed that. Uh, Donnie Chin was murdered in 2015, summer time. I started writing in fall of 2016 spent about three years writing and researching, another year in editing, and the book came out last year, uh, last fall. So it's been out, oh, I don't know, maybe about nine months or so. Printed 2,500 copies, they're nearly all gone. Uh, so for a, a niche publication, it's moved quite briskly. Um, the book, um, tells 
stories of my history, my family's history, my growing up years as a Franklin grad, Southeast Seattleite mostly, um, but then also how the city has changed along with it and stories of people that I know and grew up with and people I learned from. Um, and that comprises the 72 chapters in there. Um, you'll probably recognize a lot of these places because uh, I tell stories um, uh, from these places, all the way from Chubby and Tubby, who, uh, which I'm sure you all remember, uh, the old wigwam store, um, uh, the uh, Woolworths. Uh, uh, it's interesting, uh, more recently, I, I went to, on the final day uh, when uh, Oberto Outlet closed, and, and that was part of my growing up years. Boracinis, right? I see you guys shaking your heads. I sure you recognize all these places. The old Beacon Hill Library at the Beacon Junction was my hangout. Uh, the uh, 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 South China restaurant. Again, I could go on and on. And uh, so you'll find things that um, perhaps refresh your memory um, and also uh, bring forth other memories that um, uh, you find uh, are precious as well. Um, now, in terms of the stories in, um, the book, um, and you see there an image of the uh, Highlight Cafe on the corner of um, Maynard Avenue and South King Street. Uh, it's changed, obviously. The elderly Filipino men who used to populate Chinatown are, are all gone. They're 100% gone. But I shared stories of many of them uh, as well. And I'm talking about specific stories of people. Um, People have asked since the book came out, they're, they're amazed, well, how are you able to describe in detail uh, conversations you had with folks uh, from the 1970s and uh, the 1980s and, um, and describe uh, detail that uh, your memory must be astonishing. Well, I do think, I have a fairly precise memory with having worked as a journalist because you're trained that way. But the other thing, and I'm sure you all would appreciate it, back in the old days, people wrote letters to one another, right? Um, this is before the internet. Well, I was one of those folks who saved all my letters in the original envelopes. So um, I could recreate um, memories from a correspondence that I had had with folks. Um, and so I was able to document a lot of things. Uh, the core of the stories really were from my experience, which was about um, being the uh, son of um, a Chinese hand laundry uh, operator uh, who later became the head waiter at the Hong Kong restaurant. Some of you probably remember that Chop Suey restaurant. It was one of the big uh, restaurants uh, in the area. My father was a waiter there for over 30 years, and I bust dishes for 10 years, uh, raising, uh, saving money to go to college. My mother worked in the sewing factories, um, a place called Far West Garments, uh, Seattle Glove Company, uh, Rafi, uh, Seattle Quilt Manufacturing. Uh, I could go on and on. There's a lot of detail there. Um, I decided, well, you know, it would be nice to tell stories, not from the point of view of the food, for example, in the restaurants, which customers go to get, but from the lives of the people who actually served you. Because who, what do you know about these people? And then the women who sewed the, um, the gloves and the ski jackets um, and the downfield uh, garments. What do you know about who they are? Um, so the story is, my book is an attempt to tell the stories of the people that you might have passed by, but you didn't know. Uh, they were the uncles and aunties and people in my memory. Uh, I also tell the story, which has not been really told, 
in much detail of the Chinese who came here before the 1960s. My grandfather came here in 1911 to Seattle, worked in the uh, salmon canneries in Alaska, also worked as a dealer in one of the um, lottery houses in Chinatown. Um, and then my father and my uncles came, my mother came after World War II. Um, but uh, my grandfather came here illegally under the Chinese Exclusion Act um, because uh, uh, prior to World War II, Chinese laborers were barred by law from coming here to this country. So anybody who came here uh, with rare exception, was essentially coming here illegally, uh, fleeing poverty and famine and war in China. Um, so I describe what it's like to be living here under that shadow. And it has relevance to what's happening now with those who are coming here and some of the immigration debate. And then a lot of what we see in terms of the targeting of particular um, groups, um, because it's all been done before. Um, but I wanted to retrieve that history from a personal standpoint. So the book is um, a collection of a lot of stories that you probably have never heard before, that you've never seen before, um, but that I hope has uh, some place in all of our collective history, um, because it's, um, you know, it's American history. Um, this month is um, Asian Pacific Heritage Month. So I've actually been speaking at a lot of events of late and um, uh, it's been interesting to do uh, because um, I think often uh, in Asian Pacific Heritage Month, uh, I believe started in 1978. Um, but, you know, it was a tiny thing when it was first marked, but then now we realize, well, there's a lot in the settling of uh, Seattle and the settling of all of the places around the West Coast that's um, part of our, um, should be part of our common history and, um, and we should embrace it. So my hope was that in my Unforgotten Seattle, it was just one of many stories that will begin re-emerging um, that will um, hopefully um, bring us all closer together and create some greater understanding. Um, I could go on and on about, um, about you know, 600 some pages, but I won't uh, take a full morning kind of doing that. It might be more productive for me to uh, maybe open it up to uh, questions if people have questions specifically about um, um, the book itself or about my history. I'm happy to share, answer any questions. Well, like I said, I read the book. I devoured it. Uh, a lot of the people I knew, heard about, read about. And I'm just curious, does anybody out there have any personal uh, interactions with some of the things in the book or any particular ties with um, International District or any questions or observations you'd like to share with the group or questions to ask of Ron? Well, there's a question in the chat from Nancy. Okay. And it says... Uh... Oops, and here it is. Uh, okay, uh, we, uh, Ron, we speak on your colleague and friend, Bob Shimabuku, who passed away recently. Um, so, uh, Bob, uh, I wrote an article on, which uh, was published in the International Examiner. Bob uh, was an extraordinary individual. He, he wrote a book about the Japanese American redress movement and how he was born in Seattle uh, through the efforts of the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, he, um, he passed away recently. Um, he was 75, um, pretty full life, but very unexpected and very, um, very tragic. I'm still feeling the effect of that. Um, he, um, he also helped us create an exhibit at the Wing Loop Museum on the Japanese American incarceration. And he uh, helped um, recreate a barrack from um, Minidoka, Idaho, working with some of the uh, Nisei. Uh, very meticulous job that he did on that. 
um, he, um, yeah, he was, he was quite a visionary. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest that you might want to check into, uh, check out the International Exam. You can Google it actually online. Um, I think there's an article of Jerry Larch and Seattle Times did on him as well. Um, I was thinking actually now that I'm on the verge of a reprint of the book, that maybe I would include a chapter on him. Uh, um, let's see, I see a question. Ron, could you talk about the theater in Hillman City? I don't know quite what theater that question is talking about. So I'm not sure I can address that question. I'm going to jump ahead to the next question. Is there any hope of solving Donnie Chan's murder? Um, that question is a lot. And yes, it is Donnie Chin, C H I N, not C H E N. Um, I doubt it. So, Donnie was, I've talked to the investigators with the Seattle Police Department uh, uh, about the case. Um, he was killed in the crossfire between two rival East Asian, uh, I'm sorry, East African gangs. Um, and you know, it would it would require uh, some gang members uh, stepping forward and actually um, ratting on someone else. These um, youth, they have a, the police have a general sense of who did it, uh, but they're not sure which one of them, and there isn't sufficient evidence because they weren't able to recover the murder weapon to be able to have the physical evidence to prove the case. So that's the tragedy of it. And then, you know, um, I, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him. He was an inspiration. And in this time period where we've had a rise in anti-Asian um, incidents, attacks and so forth, um, partly spurred by our former president, uh, Trump, you know, this talk of Corona, this China virus, and Kung flu, and so forth, it has really um, inflamed um, a lot of this um, anti-Asian sentiment. But Donnie was the one who, you know, made sure that our elderly living in the community who couldn't speak English and who were more frail uh, were not assaulted, and um, you know, he served as kind of a safety patrol. But um, you know. We, I think about him often. There is a new safety patrol now down here um, in the International District um, that some of the younger folks of another generation have have um, um, uh, organized. So that's great. that movement is continuing. Uh, I see a question. Can you talk about the production and release of the film Beacon Hill Boys? Um, I don't know if, how many of you have actually seen the film. It's a little bit of a minor classic now. It was done years ago. My connection to it is that my old Dodge Dart Swinger from the early 1970s was in the, the film. Uh, it also uh, was partly filmed at Imperial Lanes. Some of you bowling alley. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, uh, there's a friend of mine, Ken Mochizuki, who um, grew up on Beacon Hill. Uh, he went down to um, um, Los Angeles to try to become an actor. Um, a friend of his, Marilyn Takuda, uh, another former classmate at um, uh, Franklin High School, went down there as well. In any case, um, they didn't have great success, Marilyn more so than Ken. Um, but he wrote this book titled Beacon Hill Boys while he was waiting for, um, to, <laughs> waiting for acting gigs that never came. He eventually moved back up there to Seattle. But um, he created this little iconic uh, film, which at some point uh, will, um, I think, uh, be reshown. Uh, the book was published as a scholastic um, time. Oh, great. Okay. Now, what was there? Uh, there was another question that was 
about my grandfather, right, or something? Right. How did he get here? My grandfather. Uh, so he um, he came here from. Uh, there was a village called Falsek, which was a uh, you know most of the villages that the Chinese, early Chinese immigrants came from were um, rural villages, small villages where people did farming and fishing. And he came here um, in 1911 um, by um, basically fabricating a story about having been born in uh, Pioneer Square uh, in the 1870s. And uh, again, that's how the Chinese were able to come here because in 1980. Excuse me, in 1882, Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, barring Chinese laborers from coming here. The only, only way they could come here was by saying that they were somehow here before 1882. Um, and because the San Francisco earthquake had destroyed all the immigration, um, so he, he came here basically by buying some papers which allowed him to create a story about having been born in Seattle before the, um, uh, before the Chinese um, Exclusion Act. And then that's how he came over. Now, Ron, were, they, were those called paper sons? Or was there a term for people that had the papers? Um, yeah, the, the, the term was paper sons. So the, those are folks who um, basically bought papers to come over, um, and they may or may not have been the actual name that they said they were. Um, and so wh what you bought were the papers that you know included uh, a photograph, included uh, you know coaching papers, uh, included. Um, uh, often um, testimony from uh, white uh, citizens, you know, uh, um, testifying the fact that you actually were who you said you were. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that, and, and I don't recall how, how much it was. There's an actual amount that he paid. Um, so, let's see, I'm looking here. My computer is booting up. Uh, was there another question while I'm trying to get back on here? I I wonder if you're on CenturyLink because my my internet uh, stopped working and I'm on CenturyLink. I don't know if it's a connection here at the house or something's going on with CenturyLink. I'm on. I'm okay. using my phone right now. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm on CenturyLink, so it must be a CenturyLink uh, problem. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Ron, they have on the screen now is an old vintage postcard of the Hong Kong restaurant. Yeah. And you can see just a very portion uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the famous neon ceiling. I loved that ceiling. I, John and I used to eat there a lot. And oh my it's the, was the best ceiling of any restaurant ever. And the vintage cars that are parked in front of it, I'd like to see one of them get into a parking space at a Trader Joe's or a PCC uh -huh. right now, or anybody who could parallel park those things. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the restaurant was a pretty amazing place. I describe it in detail in the book. You know, there, there was a, a neon dragon that draped, so picture the ceiling, this neon dragon that, you know, uh, uh, kind of wound its way around. And that was the lighting for the dining area. There was also a, uh, a an aquarium with a lot of fish uh, swimming around. It was an amazing viewing aquarium that separated the uh, first dining floor to, from the second dining um, level, and you probably remember it, Mary. Right? Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, yeah. And and then the food, you probably remember the food. Oh well. yeah. <laughs> so, everyone had their favorites. You know, they they came back and seemed like everybody 
picked their dishes and they they you know they wanted their set menu and uh, the waiters back in the day they knew all the customers by name and so they knew what their favorite dishes were so there was a much more personal relationship than there is today nowadays you don't know your server um and you're just concentrating on the food but you know my my father working there he knew um many of the, the, the local families he knew their children he watched them grow up and he got great tips uh from uh, you know a lot of the uh customers who were were the regulars so very different See, now I have not heard of the film, The Beacon Hill Boys. So I'm going to be searching that out and uh, checking it out. Yeah, if you want, uh, Mary, I'm happy to set it up. So you guys, maybe during one of your meetings, you might want to, you know, uh, have a showing of, you know, uh, you know the film. Because it, it, it'll it bring you back to the 1970s where people, you know, had the flared uh, pants and, <laughs> You know, the mutton chops, right, and the uh, long hair and, you know, the wide collars and, you know, uh, it, it's just that era of the 1970s. Yeah, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, oh, you can't see them. That's right. Um, and then they flash on my screen quickly and then they're gone. Does somebody have know how to open that chat room and read those questions to Ron? Yeah, I do. I mean Ron, uh, one of the questions is uh, your uh, your mother. Did she work out of the home after she raised her children or during? I'm sorry, my what, what, what was the question? Again? The, the question was about your mom. Did she work out of the home? Um, so after we were shipped off to elementary school, and it was the old Beacon Hill School, which now is El Centro de la Raza. Um, she she went uh, to work in the sewing factories. Now she didn't work um, doing any sewing in the home. It was in the factories themselves. So um, some of the places she worked at were uh, the Seattle Glove Company uh, on Twelfth and Twelfth uh, and Weller. Is it? I think Twelfth and Weller. It's now McPherson's Leather Company. Uh, she also worked at Far West Garments uh, oh. over in the Rainier Valley yeah. over on Poplar Street. I think the building is still there. Yeah, it is. Uh, Seattle Quilt Manufacturing Company um, uh, over on First Avenue. And that building is now an apartment building. And the big one was Rossi. Uh, I'm sure some of you remember over by the uh, Greyhound Bus Terminal. Um she also worked at Sportcaster and oh, a few yeah. other places. Those are all the big places. There was a, some of you probably remember the uh, Black Bear manufacturer, yeah. uh, Black Bear. Yep, that was there. Um, yeah, so she was at all those places. The book kind of tells the story of how much she made, what she did, and all that stuff. And people say, well, how are you able to get together? I said, well, I interviewed her before she passed. Um, and that's something often in, in books, uh, you know, people don't interview the people that they think aren't considered important enough. But, you know, I, I was very intentional about wanting to uh, gather the stories of people I knew uh, and people who were part of my community. And that's really about preserving history. John DeFranco, I'm going to ask you to read another question because you know how to do that with your chat room thing. Uh, let me see. The Green Village was in a space that had obviously been a nightclub. Does anyone know more about that? Um, Green Village. So there was a Green Village restaurant. I'm trying to remember. Was it on... Avenue. I know the building it was in because I used to eat there. Um, I don't know that was a nightclub. There was, uh, was a little bar area up above later that uh, was, became a restaurant. Okay. 
That's about all I know there. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of get back online, and it's not allowing me to. Let me just see here. Ron, while you were out, the question, one of the questions was, what year did you graduate from Franklin? And I think uh, someone said that was 1971. Yep, that's correct. Who, who, are some of the, who are some of the people you remember most of Franklin that became uh, well-known? Because so many people from Franklin became well-known. How about from your time at Franklin? Do you remember any of them? I'm sure there are a few. Okay, I'm getting that on. on. I'm going to hang up the phone. Good, you're back okay. on. Okay. Yay! Okay, well, I'm surprised people are still here. There must be some thing of interest. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so a uh, question about uh, who were some of the students from my era, from yes. Franklin? Yeah, that became, that, that um, were well known, because I know there are a few. Yeah, yeah. Well, Folks that have, I immediately come to mind are um, uh, Dean Sudakawa, um, uh, who passed away recently, kind of sad. Uh, he is, and of course, the whole Sudakawa clan, um, Mayumi and Cherry. Um, actually, we're, I'm working with Cherry on an installation for this aging in place facility. Um, that's going to be developed on the north uh, parking lot next to uh, Pacific Tower. Um, let's see, other Franklinites. Uh, oh boy, um, geez. Uh, a little different era, but Gary Locke, obviously. Uh, and who's the, uh, who's that uh, musician? That jazz perform uh, musician, Kenny G. Uh, Kenny G. Yeah, yeah. Again, a few years uh, away from me, um, but uh, uh, boy, so you, you probably shoot. You probably know some folks. Uh, those are the ones that need to come to mind. And there are a lot of folks I work with in the community who 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 aren't considered like you know high visibility folks, but I see day to day. So there's still a lot of folks around. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, comments? Uh, Peter, Peter uh, Nikitani had asked, uh, made a comment, and, and uh, uh, I was asked to read that to him. It says, the highlight of Beacon Hill Boys is the scene at Imperial Lanes with Frank Fuji playing himself as we knew him over the years. It was yeah, a stirring yeah. emotional moment for, the, for me. The film was played at the Nisai Veterans Community Committee Hall when Mr. Fuji was on his last legs. His audience applause was an outpouring of everyone's love for him. Anyone who fondly remembers Mr. Frank Fuji should make it a point to see Big and Hill Boys to see, uh, to see him again. Ron, you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, um, and I read about him in my book. Um, he was very close. I knew one of his daughters, uh, Ann Fuji, um, Ann Fuji Linwall. Um, Quite well, she worked for me when I was editor of the International Examiner. Um, but uh, Frank was an amazing person. He taught at Franklin, uh, and then later taught at Seattle Central Community College. Actually, um, he was mostly worked in the graphics department there, uh, and I was stationed in the same um, uh, same little um, structure. Which is now, which is torn down, and I think there's a bookstore there in that location. But um, yeah, he would he um, he taught he made art accessible to everybody. Uh, he was a great coach too. I mean, he coached uh, our winning um, Franklin Quaker basketball team uh, a couple of seasons. Uh, he passed away sadly. Um, uh, and I still think about him all the time. He used to invite me all the time to go to Jack in the Box down the street. Because he said, things are stereotyped, we work too much. So, Ron, let's get out of here. Let's go grab something to eat. 
uh, or we'd go across the street uh, to to the um, the bakery at uh, Seattle Central, and we grab some stuff to eat. So, um, yeah, fond memories. Um, there's a lot of his spirit imbued in the Longwood Museum, where I um, worked for 17 years, and um, dealt with him in terms of a lot of art exhibits. Mm -hmm. Ron, Nancy wants to know who are your high school friends. High school friends. Uh, Marilyn Takuda was one. Um, there's a guy named Ray Benson, who, um, interestingly enough, turns out to be the uh, brother of someone uh, who is married to um, uh, uh, one of my best friends, uh, Sally Yamasaki, who's also in the book, who helped with um, the Japanese American incarceration exhibit. It's funny, you know, how the community is still very tight knit. You find, find well, oh, like I went to so-and-so who uh, is related to another person. And so there's still that element there that I'm finding all the time. I'm looking at some others here. Yeah. Uh, my sister, Julie Nectani, graduated from Franklin in 1974. My brother, Doug, uh -huh. went to Sharpless with Tom Adida and Kenny G, but opted to, or, to Cleveland for sports. <laughs> Sorry, okay, I guess that's yeah. more of a comment. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, and I don't know if there are any relation. To, uh, Amy Nicotani, the artist uh, who passed away about a year ago, uh, I don't know if there's any relation, uh, but Amy is the aunt of Jeff Hanada, who is uh, somebody that uh, designed the cover for me, uh, the uh, cover of my Unforgotten Seattle. I see him over at the Jeff Jefferson Golf Course all the time. But uh, yeah. Uh, Becky had a question. Did you know her brother Jim Corpus at Franklin? Name sounds familiar. The, the memory cells aren't stimulating. <laughs> I might have. Uh, boy, it's been a while. Um, yeah. You know, the people who influenced me, I talk about uh, Rick Nagel, who everybody was obviously in. Oh, yeah. At. Roberto Maestas, I write about him. He was my Spanish teacher. And uh, then later, of course, he took over my old Beacon Hill Elementary School and then converted into a Centro de la Raza. But uh, I talk about him uh, as well. And uh, Barb Nielsen, who- uh, Oh yeah, Tennis U Nielsen. Yeah. yeah, Mrs. Nielsen. And I later reconnected with her. She's retired now. She's mm -hmm. in her nineties, right? Yeah, yeah. When I visited her. And she was very active with the, um, um, Historical Society in uh, Maple Valley, you know, but she kept in touch in the years and I write about her as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she was in charge of the Tolo at Franklin for several years. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And anybody who went to Franklin, Mr. Nagel was a rock star. That's all I can say. Yeah. He is a rock yeah. star. Well, and I had lunch with him. Uh, in preparation for my memoir. So he, you know, people don't realize I interviewed probably about 200 people wow. in connection with my memoir because I want to make sure I had the details right. So I checked yeah. in with him. And, and Maxine Liu, who was a counselor, I believe, uh, ESL instructor at Franklin. I also had lunch with her and Rick Nagel in Chinatown. And Maxine Liu passed away um, shortly before my book came out, but I included her in the book. So there'll be a lot of folks from the neighborhood that uh, will be yeah. working out books. Yeah, yeah. Mary, do you want to say anything about CQIE? Oh, golly. Uh, Citizens for Quality Integrated Education back in the 70s, uh, before anybody even knew what integration and racial diversity really meant, Seattle Public Schools was trying to, did put, together a program. There were about five of us on staff. Um, Francis North, 
Gladys, uh, Tony Horn, Ron, myself, Dolly. Cassie, was Kazi Katayama there? Kazi Katayama, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And Kazi's sister, Mako Nakagawa. Mako Nakagawa. She passed away a couple of weeks ago, actually. Wow. Yeah. She was a Mako was a, she wore black leather jackets before it was popular. She was really yeah, right. she was a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. And then Ben yeah. Nakagawa, Mako's husband, yeah. uh, was principal at Wingluck Elementary School, where my children both started their their life in Sale Public Schools. And Ron, of course, was at Wingluck for what, 17, 18 years. Yeah, and yeah. really a driving force making that museum such an outstanding museum that it is today. And if any of you who have not had an opportunity to visit Wingluck Museum, I highly recommend it. It is just an outstanding museum. And well, people come from all over to see it, but we're so lucky to have it in our backyard. Well, there you go. You got a program for your future you know, a uh, uh, meeting of Rainer Yeah, Bowers. a tour. A tour yeah. of the Wendluck Museum would be great. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to help you, you know, we're, as we start coming out of this pandemic uh, period, I'm happy if you wanted me to lead you through. Um, I described the, the conversion of that historic hotel into the new museum mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in, in detail in the book. Yes. And I would say, you know, I'm happy to, Happy lead a tour if, if you're interested. Okay. Okay. Well, I would like to say thank you, Ron, for this wonderful time you spent with us and sharing your book, your stories, your insights. And I, for one, am thrilled to know you're full of energy moving forward to keep doing all the good things you've been doing for so many years. And don't forget to tend your garden. It's the sun's going to come out this afternoon. You can go out and play. Okay, well, I trust that many of you will be doing that uh, soon, right? Because the sun will come come out. Uh, and thank you all for um, allowing this time to chit chat about my book. And do buy a copy of the book because it, all the proceeds go to benefit the International Examiner. I I don't collect a cent from from uh, its publication, and it's going to be it's going to be gone soon. I mean, literally will be out of print. So uh, 